Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Our top story, U.S.-China decoupling speeding up on the biotech front. A new bill is moving one step forward in the House. How does Beijing's ambition to collect American DNA play in? TikTok users are filing a First Amendment suit against the U.S. government. That's over a law that could ban the popular platform. YouTube is moving to block a protest anthem inside Hong Kong to comply with a court order banning the song. More on YouTube's response. And Filipino activists and fishermen are taking the sea in protest. Together, sailing 100 small boats near a disputed shoal in the South China Sea. We'll take a look at the footage. The U.S. taking another step to uproot China from the biotech supply chain. That's as a new bill passes a House committee Wednesday. Big players in the industry are already bracing for changes ahead. NTD's Juliet Song has the details. A bill that could shake up U.S. biotech industry is moving closer to becoming law. It sets a new deadline, 2032. By then, U.S. companies must stop working with four Chinese biotech firms, BGI, Uxi Aptech, MGI, and Complete Genomics. The bill would also ban federal agencies from contracting with these Chinese companies or using their equipment and services. Behind the push is one big concern, that when American blood gets drawn at hospitals, the DNA information could end up in Beijing's hands. How could this happen? Some U.S. hospitals and research institutions use Chinese genome sequencing services because they're cheap. But this in turn allowed at least 15 Chinese firms to access American patients' genetic data. And if Beijing asks for it, under Chinese law, these companies can't say no. That's why lawmakers are targeting these four Chinese biotech companies. Among them, BGI is the leading genetic sequencing equipment maker on the U.S. market. Previously, the company harvested genetic data from 8 million pregnant women in Europe via prenatal tests and used it for research with the Chinese military. BGI denies giving data to Beijing. One of the world's biggest drug makers, Norvartis, is already on the move to cut ties with Chinese drug makers. The White House says it would slap a 50 percent tariff on Chinese syringes and needles, plus an up to 25 percent tariff on Chinese face masks and surgical gloves. The bill still needs to move through the House and Senate before being signed into law. Juliet Song, NTD News. To talk more about the U.S.-China trade war on health-related items, we spoke with Stephen Bryan, senior fellow at the Center for Security Policy. Stephen Bryan, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you back on the show. Pleasure to be with you, Tiffany. Now, the Biden administration's new tariffs on China also include Chinese medical supplies like syringes, personal protective gear, face right. masks, respirators, etc. How much do you see the pandemic and the hit to the supply chains that we saw during that time fit into this move? Well, it certainly fits in because we were very dependent on China for all these key supplies. And I don't know that we've done much to stockpile them for the future, which would have been a sensible thing for the government to do, given the you know what happened. And yet, uh, so now if we cut it off now, what are we going to do? Where are we going to get it from? I don't know. I mean, I don't think they know either. I think that's the problem here. Everybody's you know wants to whack China because that's a good election move, but I don't think they're thinking this through at all. And lately, there's been a lot of talk of, say, Chinese unfair trade practices because a lot of the companies are state subsidized from the Chinese regime, unlike, you know, a lot of the ones in America. But given the landscape we're seeing, how are we going to get to that balance where, you know, people can get the things they need from other sources? Because right now it seems China dominates several sectors. How is that change going to happen? Well, usually in, you know, in the competitive world, you make investments into an industry, uh, you compete. If you have a better product and a better price, you win. That's how it works. Now, uh, of course, the Chinese government has underwritten in direct and indirect ways a number of their industries. 
because they wanted to establish them as, as powerhouses in the field and take over that segment of trade. That's been a constant uh, situation, but that applies to just about everything coming out of China. So uh, I think if, if, you, if you don't want to trade with China, then you make a decision, we're not going to trade with China, but we can't do that. Expanding on that last part, what is the strategy the U.S. should be taking then when it comes to something like this? Well, I think, first of all, you have to have the willing. That is, the companies, U.S. companies have to be willing to enter into that kind of competition and that kind of trade and want to do this. I don't see them lining up, to, you know, especially lining up to get in the business. Now, if, if they're protected by a tariff or by some other mechanism, that's not really competition. It's not really free trade. It's, it's uh, you know, it's just as bad as what the Chinese do with subsidizing. Uh, and that's all it is, is subsidy, because the prices are going to be higher here and the consumers are going to pay more. Stephen Bryan, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Washington's new China tariffs are kicking up a fuss inside the communist regime. Beijing's foreign ministry hitting back at the policy Wednesday, calling it, quote, the most typical form of bullying. Prior to Washington's announcement, Beijing had already signaled that it would retaliate if the tariffs were activated. China has targeted U.S. food and agriculture with its own tariffs in the past. Speaking at the World's Garden Tuesday, President Biden defended the increased tariffs, calling the move, quote, strategic and targeted. The new policy will boost tariffs on some of the most critical sectors, including semiconductors, electric vehicles, lithium batteries, solar cells and medical products. Among them, taxes on imported Chinese electric vehicles will jump from the current 25 percent to 100 percent. We have vulnerabilities in our supply chains. We've made it a national priority to diversify our supply chains. What's more, experts and U.S. officials fear China could reroute its products through third-party nations like Mexico and Vietnam to avoid tariffs. Some say without efforts to prevent that, Chinese products could still find their way into the U.S. market. For instance, Mexico overtook China as the top source of U.S. imports. But concerns have risen over Mexico potentially turning into a transshipment hub for Chinese products. Meanwhile, an American soybean trade group is pushing for a round of levies on used cooking oil from China. They argue imported products threaten the demand for domestic ingredients. The world's largest electric vehicle maker, China's BYD, is apparently making a statement in response to Biden's new tariff announcement Tuesday. On Tuesday, for the first time ever, the Chinese EV maker launched a new product outside of its home country. BYD chose Mexico for the debut, a mid-sized hybrid electric pickup truck. The company's chief of Americas says the company doesn't have plans to go to the U.S. market, so the tariff announcement doesn't impact BYD, adding that it had only considered the Mexican market and other countries' markets when making the decision and had not considered the U.S. The unveiling event in Mexico came just hours after President Biden announced steep tariff increases. The vehicle is for now only available in Mexico. A no-limits friendship, that's how the top leaders of China and Russia define their bilateral ties. Russian President Vladimir Putin is visiting China this Thursday and Friday. Here's what to look out for. Putin told Chinese state newspaper Xinhua one day before his trip that he backs China's plan for a peaceful solution with Ukraine. That's after war has raged for more than two years. Besides Ukraine, energy and trade also top talking points for the Chinese and Russian leaders. Putin will make stops in Beijing and the Chinese city of Harbin. During Putin's visit, the northern city is set to host a trade expo for Chinese and Russian companies. He's expected to discuss the potential for more trade opportunities with Beijing, an effort to counter Western sanctions against Moscow. Analysts say Beijing uses its influence over Moscow as a bargaining chip with the West, with the goal of securing more investment and trade opportunities from the U.S. and Europe. On top of that, some analysts say the Ukraine war could distract Washington and other European countries from keeping an eye on Beijing, especially as China's military ramps up aggression in the Indo-Pacific. Washington recently warned Chinese bankers and exporters that there would be consequences if they are found supporting Russia's military. 
A group of TikTok creators is suing the federal government over a new law that could lead to the popular platform's nationwide removal from U.S. app stores. President Biden signed the legislation last month requiring TikTok to cut ties with its Chinese parent company or be ousted from the U.S. The group that filed the suit altogether boasts millions of followers. They claim the law would keep them from creating and sharing expressive material through their chosen publisher, as well as viewing content from other users. Their suit calls the law unconstitutionally overbroad. It's the second lawsuit filed against the government over the potential ban, driven by U.S. security concerns about TikTok's China-based parent company, ByteDance. Last week, ByteDance sued the government in federal court in Washington, alleging the law violates First Amendment rights by threatening to shut down a communication medium that's part of American life. TikTok has about 170 million U.S. users. That's about half the United States population. YouTube is complying with censorship orders in Hong Kong. A court recently banned a protest song called Glory to Hong Kong at Beijing's request. On Tuesday, YouTube said it would follow through and block access. Now, videos of the song on YouTube show this content is restricted in your country or region based on local law. YouTube said it's disappointed by the court decision and will, quote, consider options for an appeal to promote access to information. YouTube also said links to the videos will no longer show up on Google search in Hong Kong. Critics say the ban is a blow to freedoms in the financial hub amid Beijing's tightened control. Hong Kong does not have an official anthem. Glory to Hong Kong was written in 2019 during large-scale pro-democracy protests that year and became an unofficial anthem for many Hong Kongers. Moving to the South China Sea, on Wednesday, about 100 small fishing boats filled with Filipino protesters sailed near a disputed shoal to protest against Beijing. The Chinese Coast Guard has repeatedly warded off Filipino vessels in the region. Filipino activists were seen sailing off on wooden boats with bamboo outriggers near the Scarborough Shoal. Dozens of journalists also joined a three-day voyage. A lead organizer said their mission is to assert the Philippines' sovereign rights, adding the demonstration was peaceful and based on international law. Philippine authorities sent out Coast Guards and Navy troops to keep an eye on the protest. The shoal sits near a vast fishing lagoon. According to international arbitration, it's a traditional fishing area for Chinese, Filipino and Vietnamese fishermen. But China asserted control of it 12 years ago. Manila sued Beijing over the dispute. The international ruling said Beijing has no right to control the region, but Beijing rejected the ruling. The U.S. backs the Philippines on the matter. The U.S. ambassador to China said in March that the shoal belongs to the Philippines. Chinese smartphone maker Huawei is revamping its retail strategy, aggressively opening flagship stores in China. Some of them are just a stone's throw away from Apple stores. Here's more. Huawei is rethinking its retail strategy to do battle with Apple. The Chinese tech giant is opening or revamping stores as part of a bid to take top spots in the country's smartphone market. Some of the new outlets, including this one in Shanghai, are directly opposite Apple. The Huawei branches aim to outdo its rival with unusual features, including a gym. Four such stores have opened just since December, and it marks a big change of strategy for the firm, which used to rely on licensed distributors. Counterpoint research partner Neil Shah says it's a sign the firm is serious about grabbing market share. I think Huawei has uh, stepped up uh, in terms of where they want to go, and it's very clear with their execution and the choice of design which they have uh, embraced within the store and all different type of portfolios, experiences they're focusing on uh, rather than just a singular product on a table. But it's more focusing on experience and involving the consumers uh, within the store, right? I think that is a completely novel approach. Other attractions at the stores include a coffee shop and a huge living space. It all comes as Apple's iPhone sales slide in China. They were down 6.6% over the first quarter. Huawei, by contrast, saw its shipments jump 110% and overtook Apple as the number two smartphone seller in China. Local media have hailed the rebound as a triumph over years of US sanctions on the company. 
Huawei is also seeking to produce its own chips as part of a move to counter the restrictions. Coming up, operatives working for China and Iran reportedly created deep fakes as part of a campaign to influence U.S. voters in the 2020 election. More on the new report. Is Tesla CEO Elon Musk getting special favors from China or is he walking into a trap? Our analyst breaks down China's potential leverage over Musk to influence SpaceX and its Starshield operations. The U.S. is going to depend on Starlink when its satellites are taken down by China and Russia. So I'm very concerned, as are other people. And Chinese companies dominating bids to explore Iraq for energy and taking nine oil and gas fields since Saturday. More on that after the break here on China in Focus. Welcome back to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. A new report about the 2020 race for the White House as campaigns for 2024 heat up. CNN reports that operatives working for China and Iran prepared fake AI-generated content as part of a campaign to influence U.S. voters in the closing weeks of the 2020 election. The report says current and former U.S. officials say the operatives never disseminated the deepfake audio or video publicly. It's still unclear what they prepared or why it was ultimately never used. But according to CNN, one senior U.S. official says these operations need to resonate with the American public. That's something China has struggled with. Still, deepfakes are now much easier to produce than they were four years ago, leaving officials more concerned over how a foreign entity could mislead voters with 2024's presidential election just six months away. Tesla CEO Elon Musk is tied to the world's biggest EV market, China. But his business deals raise concerns about whether the communist regime could use its hefty market as leverage over Musk to influence SpaceX. The space exploration company runs Starshield, which provides military services to the U.S. government. Gordon Chang, political commentator and the author of The Coming Collapse of China, poses a critical question, whether the Chinese regime could soon gain control over Musk and and SpaceX. Well, certainly Tesla is dependent on China. And we saw that when Elon Musk went to Beijing a week ago. Um, there he really made it very clear that he needed Chinese government support. Now, China is concerned about SpaceX because SpaceX is critical for America's return to space. And with the Starlink constellation, it's important for military purposes because the U.S. is going to depend on Starlink when its satellites are taken down by China and Russia. So I'm very concerned, as are other people, that China will exert pressure on Musk through its leverage over Tesla in order to get what it wants with regard to SpaceX. Right. And Gordon, can you expand a little bit more on what China does want with regard to SpaceX? There are a couple of things. Um, First of all, China wants to get to the moon before we return, um, because China wants to control the uh, south pole of the moon, um, because that gives it critical advantages. Um, uh, SpaceX is absolutely essential for the United States to return to the moon. So I'm sure that they would like uh, Musk to slow that down. Um, but Starlink is, is important because in a war, um, both sides are going to lose a lot of satellites. Now, Starlink is important because it now operates 60% of the live satellites in low Earth orbit. That gives the U.S. a lot of resiliency because the military can use those in a war. And if they are the only ones that are operating, it gives the U.S. a critical advantage. Clearly, China doesn't want that, um, and it's been complaining about Starlink in a number of different ways. It's trying to build its own constellation, but until it catches up, and it's a long way behind, it will want Musk to go slow on Starlink. So what are the national security risks that are associated with Musk doing business with China? Well, SpaceX is a major defense contractor. Um, And this is um, um, because uh, Musk is so dependent on China, we have to be concerned that they'll go to Musk and say, we want to know what your defense contracts are. Um, This is the same problem, for instance, that McKinsey, the consulting firm, has, because it does consulting for the Pentagon, for the U.S. intelligence agencies, 
um, for um, law enforcement in the U.S., but it also has a lot of Chinese state contracts. Well, thank you very much for weighing in this morning. Political commentator Gordon Chang, you can find him at Gordon G. Chang on Twitter. Thanks so much. Elon Musk did not immediately respond to NTD's request for comment. Chinese companies have won more bids to explore Iraq for oil and gas. They're the only foreign players to be awarded bids so far. NTD's Don Ma has more. The Middle Eastern country is issuing oil and gas licenses for nearly 30 projects. Iraq's oil minister announced that five more bids went to Chinese companies. This brings China's total to 10. Iraqi Kurdish company Car Group took two bids, and no major U.S. companies have been involved in that. So the main goal of the exploration licenses is to ramp up output for domestic use. Iraq wants the natural gas to fire the power plants uh, that rely heavily on imported gas from Iran. That's all for today's China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. If you have any feedback on the show or have something you'd like to see us cover, send us an email at chinainfocusntd.com. We'd love to hear from you. For Around the Clock original news coverage, visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.